companies? They rank companies? No, rat, rat, the rat rat company. Rat? Rat. They represent. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's a it's like a slang term, like uh, like inner city slang or something. Doesn't seem to be your forte. No, I'm. I'm my English is mm -hmm. I, I, I Initially, I was taught the British type of English, I think. Because they were always teaching us how to spell some things, and I remember neighbors who spelled differently than I did spelled here. So yeah. I assume it was. But the interesting thing is that the people who were teaching me for the TV were from America. <laughs> Yay. Sasu, nice tacos. Are you here for Python? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> we get sometimes get the JavaScript people. Right on the left one for C J. Always think about it. <laughs> yeah. So I have I have swag. Um, our company, so I work for a uh, as a startup. We're on the sixth floor. Um, pretty cool company. But yeah, we have pitch space. Like, yeah, if you want one. Yeah. You don't have to have one. Right. Hello. Hello. Yeah, Continuous iteration? Yep. Mm -hmm. Amazing, thank you. Sure. Right. I have a place today. Oh, amazing, thank you. Swag. I suggest you wait five more minutes. Yeah. Five more people will arrive. Got tacos and beer. Help yourself. Or what? Oh, amazing, yeah. yeah this is So you're consulting there for now? Uh, yeah. So this, uh, I have a bad habit of running out of work to do. Like, I automate a lot of stuff, and then I don't have anything to do anymore. <laughs> that's, that's the best. This means you're doing well. Yeah, but... Uh, they don't want to pay you. <laughs> it means I can't stay at this company forever. Right. You don't want to stay in company forever. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you should see what, what happens to people who stay in the same place. I see a little bit of it. It's not different. Yeah. After a long time, it's, you, you should be safe. Yeah, definitely love the company while I'm there. It's like a, it's like it's a, it's a funny story. It's like the super shell, like a. We get like days off all the time. You get like the first Friday of the month off. You have like tomorrow off because there's a big thing happening in this building, uh, with, like the military or whatever. Um, and just like random days, uh, people just like, oh, everyone's working from home today. How big is the team? Uh, so the tech team is four: um, me, front end developer, back end developer, uh, CTO. Uh, but we're adding another front end developer uh, uh, next week. Or the after, actually, which, uh, right after Labor Day. Yeah, it's good. Five more minutes. It's, like, it's good. Wait for twice as big. We need that to win. Every time somebody new comes in, you reset the time. <laughs> Wanna finish
GitLab has a lot more features than GitHub. Uh, it, it, it's a lot more ambitious. It tries to do a lot more than just be a Git repository. It tries to be a Git repository that also does continuous integration, and we're going to go into that, what that is, in just a second. Also, GitLab is self-hosted. Uh, yeah, also you can self-host Git, GitLab. You can do that for GitHub, too, but it costs a trillion dollars. Oh, yes. What do you mean? <clears throat> what well, can you do with GitLab that you can't do with GitHub? Uh, so, Git, GitLab, you can self-host for free because it's open source. Um, or you can self-host for like maybe like uh, like twenty dollars per user per month if you want like the enterprise edition features. Uh, GitHub to self-host GitHub, you need to get their enterprise self-hosted package, which is about a trillion dollars. So it's much more feasible to self-host GitLab. So actually. Debian, which is maybe some of the people have heard of, um, Debian is moving to GitLab for their for like their build process and for a lot of other stuff, uh, and they're having it called Salsa, but it, it's GitLab basically. So GitLab's definitely like an up and coming thing. Uh, it's a great alternative to the GitHub, and it does a lot more. And we'll get to what that is later. So I don't have a slide for this, but I'm gonna add one after this talk. So let me talk about continuous integration for a bit. So, when you're developing, hopefully you're using Git for version control. If you're not using Git for version control, um, I don't know what's going on with you. But, so let's say you're using Git for version control. Ideally, what you want to happen is when you push to, a, when you do a Git push to a repo, it automatically like tests your code, um, builds your code, like uh, installs all the dependencies, and ultimately deploys your code to either development or production if you push to the production branch, for instance. So that's like the, that's continuous integration and continuous deployment. It's taking a git push and turning it into uh, like a complete build. Uh, that's, that's really all it is. I'm sure there's a much fancier definition, but that's, that's what it actually is. So we're gonna be doing that, um, but we're not gonna be doing that just with like some Python code. We're gonna be doing that with Docker images. So one way you can think of um, like structuring an app is you have this like topmost layer where you have your Python code. Uh, oh, I said PHP or Python. That's good. Um, where you have your your Python code at the topmost layer. This is your like Django, uh, like your your like models, views, and everything. And that could be like one separate Git repository. And then in this middle layer, you have the configuration of uh, the machines that you're running your production app on. And so this is going to be like, not PHP, by the way, this is going to be um, like your Nginx config, for instance, uh, and similar stuff like that. And so there's a bunch of ways you can, you can manage this config. We're going to be using Docker, actually, in this case, to manage the config. Some people say Docker's not a configuration management tool, but we're going to be using Docker to manage the config. I, I think it can be, but uh, people will argue with me about that. So we're, yeah, we're going to be use, using Docker to manage that config. And then at the lowest level, you have physical infrastructure. You have like the actual like uh, web server, and it could be like this thing you have in Iraq. Uh, these days, it's in the cloud, whatever that means. So that's one way of organizing an app, basically. Now, this is not the only way to organize an app. It's a way that I think makes a lot of sense and that is kind of basic um, and that I'm trying to implement at the company I work for. These days, you can kind of like have different layers or you can have like serverless, which is this new technology. It's like, okay, we're not gonna have physical infrastructure anymore. We're just gonna have code somewhere, and that is like a whole other thing, but for right now, this is what we're going to talk about, this sort of <laughs> architecture. So, oh, I do have a slide on CI, so, okay, yeah, CI, I already went over this, so this is about, you push to GitLab, uh, and it builds, tests, and deploys. So in this case, we're not going to do that with the, the Python code. We're going to do that with the Docker images, and we're not and we're not going to do it with like the lowest level, which is like the physical servers, because I'm not sure if it, like 
a good way to do that right now. Um, it would be really cool. I'm not there yet. So this is, and I said this is stuff you should know. Uh, yeah, actually, I'm pretty sure most people here knows this. So who here uh, isn't sure what something on this slide is? I've, I've never used Y-A-M-L. Yeah. No. Okay, what about you? So Jason basically just saw okay. the, the, the indentation. The bottom left. Right. <laughs> the register from the dash. The, oh, bottom left? The cube. Uh, yeah, that's that's just a bash symbol. Uh, so that's like a, oh, I thought it's just some fancy bash logo I found, so yeah. You know what bash Okay, so YML, uh, you know what JSON is, right? Yes. YML is uh, like a, a data, like you, I don't know, how do you describe JSON? JSON is a way to format data and send it across servers? Yeah, in, general is the same way. thing, except okay. it's... Normalization protocol. It's a, so JSON is like a subset of YAML, uh, but YAML does a lot more than JSON and it's a lot prettier and I don't like JSON, I like YAML. I prefer everyone just do everything in YAML, but we'll, we'll see that that's not the case. So okay, now let's talk about Docker. Docker is a thing you've heard of, even if you don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm still kind of trying to figure out what Docker is. So what you, you, what you probably do know what it is, is a virtual machine. You have like this physical like computer and then you run a virtual machine on top of it. So Docker um, is, is, is not quite a virtual machine, but it's kind of similar in that uh, it has its own like, uh, it's like a layer on top of stuff. So you can run Docker like on top of a virtual machine uh, and it's a lot faster than like a, an easier to manage than an actual virtual machine. Like if you stood up an AWS instance, it's already a virtual machine. You can't put a virtual machine inside it, although that's starting to change, but not quite yet. Um, but when you can put a Docker image like inside of something else a lot more easily. Um, a virtual machine, if you restart a virtual machine, it takes like a minute, uh, two minutes these days, thanks to system D. Uh, but if you restart a Docker image, it's like instant. It's like two seconds. Um, well, maybe a bit longer than two seconds, maybe more like 30 seconds for like the production one, but it's still a lot faster than, than a virtual machine. Uh, and it's a lot faster to build too, which we're gonna see very soon. So that really helps with, uh, so when you have like this CI pipeline, um, and I should probably get a picture of like the CI pipeline, but basically the faster your build runs, like the faster you can test, the faster you can fix the bugs that you have and repeat. And so we're gonna build a we're gonna build a machine image as part of this, and you're gonna see how long that takes. And then we're gonna build a, a Docker image, and you're gonna see how much faster it is. So GitLab is uh, it is a Git repository, but it's also a CI/CD platform, continuous integration platform. And it's like, it was made really recently, so they're, they're very ambitious. They're trying to like have like native Kubernetes integration. I'm not, I'm not going into Kubernetes on here, but I'm sure you've heard that it's like a, a big new thing. Um, they have first class support for containerized builds, and they're using YAML, which I like. And that's how you define the build process. So, Question. yes. Um, maybe it's the wrong time to ask, but is GitLab compatible with GitHub? Since this GitLab is also a, a continuous deployment, it should be able to pull data from any repository. Am I wrong? So, if you want GitLab to work with GitHub, you need to actually mirror the repository into GitLab. Gotcha. Which it does support. But honestly, you should just move everything to GitLab anyway. Gotcha, makes more sense. Uh, but that we, we had that for a while where we were still coming to GitHub but then mirroring it. Um, but then we that was just as part of a transition period to, to move to GitLab completely. I was just curious, thank you. Thank you. So uh, okay, so now Packer is a tool for building machine images. You can use it to build like VMware images, you can also use it to build AMIs, Amazon machine images, that's what we're gonna be doing in this case. Getting Packer to build VMware images is a huge pain. I wouldn't recommend doing it, um, but it's, it's one of the things it does. Pretty useful. 
And it, it builds a vagrant boxes too, because it's like the tool for building vagrant boxes because it's made by HashiCorp, which made vagrant, and which made uh, Terraform. So, Hacker, <coughs> annoyingly, it, the configuration for its builds is in JSON, and we're gonna see some of that in a bit. Uh, speaking of HashiCorp, there's also Terraform. Terraform is amazing. It's like the tool for, it's, it's like the definitive infrastructure as code tool. There's some competing ones, but uh, Terraform's the only one that tries to be like cross platform really. Um, it has like a ton of support, like a lot of people are behind it these days. And for managing AWS infrastructure, it's either that or it's cloud formation. Um, with cloud formation with JSON, and no one likes, I don't like JSON. I don't want to say no one likes JSON, but I don't like JSON, so that's why, that's one of the reasons I use, uh, I use Terraform. And so, Terraform can be used for a lot of things, but the main thing, the main reason to use an infrastructure is code tools, because this way your infrastructure is documented. Like, if you spin up a server, you want like a record that, okay, I spun up the server, and you could put it in an Excel spreadsheet, but it's much better to have like um, in a Terraform, because that way not only can you like spin up servers automatically, but you can also check like, oh, um, was like the server changed and someone didn't change it, like you can make sure that what you have written down reflects the reality, which is... Maybe this is an interface where you check what the servers you spun and when and what the condition is. No, that's, what? That's, that's what Terraform does, and... But why uh, do you need Terraform then? What? Why not use the AWS interface, what's the difference? So, that's a good question. So, the AWS interface, uh, yeah, in theory, um, you, you can see like, okay, when an action was done, or like, um, or like what the state of it is, by like calling the API or whatever, or just like looking at the, um, at the dashboard a bunch. But with Terraform, uh, you put it into version control. So like, you can see like, okay, uh, on this date, like this is, all the changes that like the guy made uh, to like the, the staging environment, and you'd be wondering, oh, why is everything rearranged? Just because it was because like these were the changes made, and then the, also there's some things that are really hard to do doing the AW, using AWS interface. But if you have everything in Terraform, it's really easy. One of the things which I actually did in practice is I changed the CIDR of my uh, of like a VPC. Okay. And to do that, you need to recreate everything. But with Terraform, you can actually recreate everything. Um, relatively painful. What do you mean? So if you have to, when you spin a server, all the commands you, you put in, if you store them in Terraform, it's easier? So, so uh, we're going we're to use Terraform in a bit, but now let me just show you uh, VPC. So, So the, the VPC is like the overarching umbrella of all your, your network resources. So, um, as you can see, there's like an IP uh, range that a VPC has. So in order to change that, you need to not just, you can't just like right click and delete it. You need to delete all your servers, you need to delete all your subnets, you need to delete all your NAT gateways, and then recreate them with the new config with the new CIDR. And that would be, if you had to do that via the console, it would be completely impossible. With Terraform, if you have everything in Terraform, I was actually able to yeah, do it. Because it can script it. While yeah. Over the hill, you have to click 400 places. Yeah, so thing. we're gonna, there's gonna be a, there's actually a slide on that soon. Um, Before you proceed, sir, okay, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say is the main difference between, say, Terraform and something like CloudFormation? Uh, they're competing products. Okay. Well, cloud formation is going to be AWS only. Correct, yeah. Uh, yeah that's, that's I was thinking the same good. thing that like serverless framework has a lot of code as infrastructure components to that as well. I right. Think. Yeah. Uh, Terraform and cloud formation are direct competitors. Um, there's, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with cloud formation to give the intricate differences, but um, they're, they, they're trying to solve the same problem. <laughs> I'm yeah, familiar with CloudFormation, but not Terraform, so I was wondering what would be the mm -hmm. main characteristic of it that I should know about. Yeah, and I, I can't answer that question just because I'm not. Yeah, no, thank you. That. Very kind, thank you. But um, one thing I do know is CloudFormation is in JSON, and you can't comment in JSON, it's a huge pain. And Fire, Terraform yes. is in HashiCorp <laughs> configuration language or whatever, and you can actually comment that, and it's really nice. Gotcha. So, so I have all the code in GitLab. Oh, this is missing, this is missing one. Um, So 
But yeah, the code's all on GitLab. All, all of these slides are available on my computer. Yes. Uh, go to dockerslides.com. Very easy to remember. Dockerslides.com. Uh, actually, let me. This there. Kind of self referential. Yep. By the way, you bought a domain just for this? Yep. <laughs> nice. The domains are not expensive. I don't know. I, I have a bad habit of buying domains on a whim. Good habit. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So, all the codes on GitLab, all the slides are on line and with an easy URL. And now we're actually going to get into the meat and potatoes here. So, let's get started. Step one, you need to register an account on AWS. Uh, it doesn't need to be a clean account. I have a relatively clean account that I registered. Uh, that, the, that that's my personal account that I'm going to be going through this with you with. Uh, step two, you need to start up a, a TG Medium instance or just a, an instance in general. That's going to be your workstation instance. You're going to be, if you do work in AWS, you don't want to do it from your local machine because like the wireless bugs out, I don't know, you're downloading like all these files, it takes a long time. It's much better to spin up an instance in AWS and work off of that. Uh, using like Emacs and stuff like that. From my experience, um, at least. Uh, next, you want to install Tmux, Airform, Packer, a text editor, I like Emacs, uh, Git, Docker on that machine. And after that, you want to create an AIM user with admin access and uh, basically log on on that machine with that AIM user. Now, I've actually already done all these steps here I have a EC2 instance. Oh, not like so. EC2. I have an EC2 instance, and it's called a, it's called Docker Slides Workstation. I'm gonna log on now. It's always EC2. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's pretty important. So that's, that's step zero, basically, is to get like a, a workstation that you can work from. And you need to spin that up manually, of course, because we haven't started on many things yet, but we're going to get started on that right now. Uh, so now it's time to use Terraform. Use Terraform. So I go into a bit more about Terraform here in this slide. It's an infrastructure as code tool. It uses a state file in order to keep track of what it manages. Now this is like a, a big JSON file with a bunch of like what how it expects the server infrastructure to be. And uh, from my experience, you want to store it remotely on S3 because otherwise there's a headache or something where like uh, different people can have different um, state files if there's or like you forget to pull the state file and then you get a huge headache. So uh, manually just create a bucket on S3 for this and we should be good to go. So now we're going to get into the example code here. So let me actually, let me actually do. do, do. Packer subnet.tf and vpc.tf. Now, how Terraform works is it uh, it globs all the TF files together, just like casts them all together, and it turns them into one big TF file. Uh, what it doesn't actually work well with is like subfolders. If you create a subfolder, it's 
kind of invisible to Terraform. So Terraform repositories just look like a huge collection of PF files generally. So in main.tf, we have our AWS and S3 state configuration. And it looks like this. This is like the bucket we're using, the region. There's no AUS key here, fortunately, uh, so you're not going to hack me. So, and then in vpc.tf, we have like a bunch of Terraform VPC resources that we use to do the high level networking. And then Packer Subnet TF, we just have a subnet. So, this is a very bare bones Terraform setup right now. We're not creating a server, we're not creating any like database or anything, we're just creating some network resources, and this is so that we can use Packer, and we're gonna, we're gonna see why we're doing this soon. So, now we're gonna use Terraform. Uh, you do Terraform init to start it, Terraform plan, uh, less dash r, the r makes it so that counters work properly, and, and then you Terraform apply to do the changes. So, you saw it when we went to the VPC earlier that we don't have anything. We have just like this default VPC, which I'm not really using except maybe for the workstation. There's nothing interesting here, basically. It's totally bare bones. Or, okay, maybe there's a bit of stuff that's lying around. But, um, so now we're going to do Terraform apply. See, we have a um, we have a VPC here, and we also have a subnet there too called uh, Docker Slice Packer Subnet. So now this is the next part. Now this is for the next part. We're going to build an Amazon machine image using Packer. So uh, if you wanted to, you could copy the whole world Packer from the Packer documentation. You can try Packer build. And you get an error where it says, oh, you don't have a subnet. You need a subnet to do it. And that's because Packer tries to use EC2 Classic, which is depreciated. So you want to use Packer within a VPC. And to do that, you need to specify a subnet. So uh, that's why we create that subnet using Terraform, so that we have a subnet to run Packer in. So in the Packer JSON, you, you create a MP packer subnet variable, MP packer, like a packer subnet variable, packer subnet MP, um, and then you basically pass a subnet in via the command line when you do like a packer run. So that's like the basics, and then you run packer from like your workstation and it would create an AMI. But we're actually gonna, I'm not gonna, packer takes a while to run, so I'm not gonna demonstrate doing it manually. Uh, instead, we're just going to jump into automating it. So <laughs> we're going to automate build of uh, AMIs using Packer using GitLab continuous integration. So GitLab is configured through this GitLab CI YML. And we want to, uh, and so in GitLab CI, you basically uh, Define the Docker image that you want the the you want the build to happen inside. So in this case, we just use hashicorp slash packer uh, colon light, which uh, you can actually just find a Docker hub of uh, packer. It's a publicly available image here, and yeah, releases are tagged from the light version. It says to be using and stuff. So this is like the, the, the YML for specifying that we're going to use that image that I just showed you on Docker Hub to do the build inside, yes? Does the image have to be in the Docker repository or can it be a private one? It can be a private one. Gotcha. Uh, we're not covering that. We're not covering that in this presentation. But yeah, thank you. For sure. Yes. Yes. So you don't usually need to say like entry point bash or whatever, but for some reason with this you do. Just one of those random things. Yeah. Uh, so this is gonna give an error. Why does it give an error? Oh, so this gives an error, this gives an, a packer error where it's gonna say like, oh, 
you don't have credentials to build an AMI. And the reason that it worked when we did it on our workstation um, is because we did AUS configure and we had a, an IAM account with admin access. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into, we're gonna go into AWS and we're gonna go to AIM, AIM, and we're going to manually create a, a user that has this access. Um, and they give like uh, other here they give the, the the minimum access that you need in order to use the hacker. So that's the access that we gave it. So we created this uh, Docker slides hacker user, and then you go into GitLab. settings, CI, CD, you can see there's variables here that you can put into the, and you can pass into the job. In this case, we have our AWS access key, secret access key, and also runners, which we'll get to later. And that is from creating the AI yeah, user. Yep. Not to interrupt again, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Packer can work with any other cloud provider. Azure can work with Google, I think it so, provided yes. the, pro the proper you know, permissions. I think so, yeah. So Google also has this, this thing called Daisy, which does a similar thing. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, which is, came out which came out in beta really recently. That's kind of how Google is. So, um, Question for mm -hmm. The uh, access keys, are they staying on GitLab, or are they going down to the machines? They're, well, you put them into GitLab, and then GitLab passes them over to the GitLab runner, which runs the, the build. It doesn't actually go into the AMI that we're building with Hacker. Um, the runner does get it um, temporarily as like an environment variable, gotcha. uh, which it which it needs to in order to run Hacker. And your GitLab is local, correct? Uh, no, this is GitLab.com. I trust them. Uh, it, it, okay, it's private at least. So if you put if you put your password, then so I have the password. In this, but you, if you're a public user, um, you won't be able to see the, the settings. No, I, 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 I'm trying to figure out something. It's like you put in a password and a, and a user and a password, correct? Somewhere. That somewhere you said it's in GitLab, and then later it's passed to AWS, correct? Or did I miss So GitLab, GitLab, yeah. GitLab.com has it, and it passes it to. A GitLab runner, and in this case, we're gonna we're gonna start by using the GitLab shared runner. So it passes it to that in, in its like sort of isolated environment, which then runs it and builds an AMI using it. Now you can't actually, if you're a pub, member of the public, you can't. Okay, get so why the, the why the AWS? What's what's the AWS thing to show it was running today? Or is it or is it GitLab here? This is, ah, this is GitLab. Yeah, oh, this is GitLab. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Repository. I, I got, I got it. I got it. But Which this, whatever you put in is private. You, no one can go there. Yeah, and that's not so local. Technically, yes. It's, yeah. it's not local, but it's private. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Uh, but you said before that GitLab can be made local. Yes. Okay. So you don't need to use GitLab.com. I just use it for convenience and because uh, I trust them. If you want to be more enterprise-y, you can have a internally hosted GitLab.com, um, and that way GitLab um, Incorporated doesn't get any of your secret data. In this case, GitLab gets my secret data, and I just need to trust that they won't hack me. Um, but if you self-host the GitLab, then they wouldn't get your secret data. It's a bit cold, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay, so uh, I'm, I'm not on. freezing in the <laughs> rain. <laughs> okay, so that's where we put in our, our AWS credentials. So we're still hard-pinning the subnet, and um, 
We're hard coding the subnet in, uh, Packer. In, in, in Packer or something, but I actually wrote this like crazy bash script uh, that queries AWS um, and like runs on AWS commands to get the subnet. Um, and I wrote it in like, normally you could just do like uh, AWS EC2 describe instances uh, if you install the AWS CL CLI command line program, but the, I only wanted to use publicly available uh, Docker images, and this doesn't have AWS uh, CLI installed. So you can actually do it with Bash, but it's a uh, it's pretty comical. Let me show you the script. So uh, let's see. this is getpackersubnet.bash, and basically you take the key and access key, and then you call. Uh, then you call um, open SSL a bunch of times and stuff like that. And eventually it, it signs the request and actually turns into an AWS API request. This is totally optional. There's a lot more sensible ways to do this, but uh, so this is a template bash script? No, this, this is this is a silly bash script <laughs> that just does a uh, AWS API request. So what? Or you wrote it or is it that? I wrote it. I wrote it. Oh, okay. Uh, I spent like two days on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Carnival okay. idea. Would not recommend it, but now that it's, it's done, you're free to download it and use it yourself. Um, the more sensible thing to do would just be to have Packer sum that in, in a variable there, but that would be sensible, so we're not doing that. Okay. Um, so. Spent two days to automate away like 30 seconds. So. Yeah. Oh yeah. I know the means. <laughs> yep. That's that's exactly what happened. I'll tell you what I spent this entire day on doing. <laughs> so yeah, don't don't ever try and do AWS API calls in Bash if you value your sanity. Just don't just don't do it. So this eventually worked, and now we're gonna build a GitLab runner AMI. And actually, let me start this build right now. We're gonna do um, Packer, and then I'm just gonna do. Uh, uh, okay, we're just gonna do. Yep. Uh, uh, wow. I just have time for one Packer build, so I'm gonna do the biggest code that I did. Okay, so. This is Packers, now we go to CI CD pipelines, and you can see um, all my commits down. Oh, it's not so bad here. Okay. And so yeah, you can see it on GitLab. This is the the CI job running. And it runs Packer build and it's gonna give a bunch of Packer output, like pre-validating AMI name, found an image ID, temporary key pair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is gonna take like five minutes to run. So, so what does it do? So what does what do? The, the run. So the runner runs the it runs the GitLab CI uh, YAML thing. You see this script thing here? The runner runs this. This those two commands. Okay. So just Subnet, get packer subnet .bash. This is the thing I was just talking about. And then it runs a packer build, passing in the packer subnet. So that's what's running. That's what's running here right now. Okay, and those JSON files are local or the repo. They're uh, yeah, you can you can download yeah, them. The They're part of the repo. Yeah. They're in the repo. Yeah. Okay. Or pack that JSON. You can download this. This doesn't have private info. I hope. Um, this is just those are accessible to it from GitHub. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So, so currently, that uh, that hacker thing is running on a shared GitLab runner, which is like a it's a basically a computer or like an instance that GitLab makes available that you can run your builds on without having to do any setup. It's very convenient. But it's not quite good enough. First of all, you only get 2,000 shared runner minutes um, if you pay. And if you don't pay, I think you get like 500 shared runner minutes, and you can run out of that very quickly. Second of all, um, it just won't build Docker containers. Like, there's just no way to build Docker containers on a shared runner. So in order to build Docker containers, 
we're going to need to host our own GitLab runner, which is something you want to do anyway so you don't run out of minutes, and for speed and for a lot of other reasons. So what's the difference between a shared and the, the ones? A shared runner is hosted by GitLab.com, and they set it up and, and they run it. Um, and why can't you do a good Docker image there? Uh, you, you can't build a Docker image there, because to build a Docker image, you need like sort of deeper access rights than security. Yeah. Because like, they, so security, they will block the shared one will block security. It's it's a bit more complicated. I'm not sure how to describe it exactly. You just can't though. Um, There's some things that are not accessible to you then? Yeah. Okay. Because you're inside a Docker image and to build a Docker image inside a Docker image, you can't just do it. You need more power than that, I guess. Um, so we're gonna, to get around this, we're gonna host our own private GitLab runners in AWS. Um, so right now, the AMI that's building is a GitLab runner AMI, um, and we're gonna get into how that's set up in this. So we, we add two provisioning steps to our package.json, we add a step to copy the files from the folder and to provide a bash script. And this is the bash script that we run, or part of the bash script that we run, it just installs Docker. Uh, this is how you install Docker according to the Docker docs. You just install their uh, repository and install from the repository, basically. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So. Sorry, is the runner AMI like a prepackaged AMI? No, we're, we're building that oh, right no. now with Hacker. This is all the script that we have right here is to build the, the GitLab runner AMI that we're going to use. Um, so that's the first part of the script that we have to build the GitLab runner AMI. This is the second part. Uh, we installed the GitLab runner program. GitLab has this GitLab runner program which you use to run a GitLab runner. And uh, to do it, we do this super insecure thing of just curling and typing into bash, which you should never do. Uh, but that's how they said to do it on their website, so that's how I'm doing it in this case. You trust them, so. Yeah, I trust them. <laughs> um, and so, so you do that, and then you you install their their pin thing uh, to make sure that you don't get the Debian version of GitLab Runner because that's old and it won't work. And then you actually run the hack and install. So if we were to test this AMI, um, what we'd have to do is log on to AWS, launch instance. My, AMI, my AMIs, then you paste the AMI ID, then you also log on to GitLab, you select the Packer project, you click pipelines, then you get the AMI ID from there. Then you uh, press select, choose instance side, configure networking, configure storage, set server name tag, set security group, press launch, select key pair, and it takes forever. Uh, this, is, this is the launch wizard. So wizards are evil, and I have a, a really pretty <laughs> evil wizard there telling you that you should not trust wizards. And it's a bunch of clicking, it takes forever, it's gonna slow down your workflow. Um, and this is even though we've automated our hacker build. We've automated the AMI building, but it's still taking us too long. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to Terraform. So that kind of brings us to part five. We're gonna create a GitLab runner auto-scaling group in Terraform. Now hopefully, this is done running, it's not done yet. Uh, so, yeah, GitLab Runner Auto Scaling Group in Terraform. So, in Terraform, we're going to create an AWS Security Group resource, an AWS Launch Configuration resource, Auto Scaling Group resource, AWS Subnet resource, and then we also add the AWS AMI as a Terraform data source, which is different from a Terraform resource. Uh, and uh, this is quoting from the Terraform docs. Use of data sources allows a Terraform configuration to build on information defined outside of Terraform. In this case, Terraform's not creating the AMI, because it can't really do that. It's Packer that's creating the AMI. So we have a data source that sort of figures out where the AMI is and just puts it in the Terraform. And then these resources are stuff that Terraform actually creates. So um, once we do that, it really simplifies our workflow. We just get pushed to Packer, and then we like stare at it and watch it run, and I think it's still running even now, which is why we're going to use Docker because Packer takes so long. Uh, then we run Terraform apply. Once the once the AMI is released, we just run Terraform apply, and it will update 
the launch configuration and everything with the new AMI. Then we just SSH into our old runner, shut down the IH now, or you can just terminate from the console or whatever. And then you SSH into a new runner, and then you can test it, debug it, or whatever. I mean, you shouldn't need the SSH into it, but like for the build, for like the for the process of like setting it up, you might need to in order to debug it. So we're gonna all right. Uh, there's a green check mark. AMIs were created. AMI. O, B, whatever, whatever. So now if you go to EC2 and let's scroll down here, AMIs. You can see we created a GitLab runner AMI. This didn't exist before I ran, before I did a Git push here. So with this GitLab runner AMI, what we're going to do is we're going to go to Terraform, check out master, um, and then we're going to uh, yeah, some more files. I have one more file. I have the, the runner.ts file. And here, this is the data source. Um, it, it just defines like how to get the name, like what the account ID is. Um, and then there's a subnet for the runner security group. Allow SSH. Um, one configuration, hard coded key name, instance type. Uh, the this is the AMI ID that it gets. It says to give it a gigabytes of space. On a scaling group, pretty straightforward. So we just do Terraform apply. And it's creating the auto scaling group uh, for the for the GitLab runner now. What is is there something that's out of, like, it will replicate itself on its own? Or? So, yeah, let me, let me show you. Um, okay. oh, I, I kind of tend to, like, log in to my company and it goes and show you there, but I'm not going to do that. Um, once, it's, once it finishes creating, I'll show you it. Right? <laughs> it should be. Just tell me. I, I okay, so uh, an auto scaling group, it's like, Let's say you have like a web server, um, but your company you don't just have one web server. You have ten web servers running the same thing, just for scaling, basically. Um, I, I get the upscale, but what does upscale group do for me? Why do I need to configure it at all? For, for this, well, I just I just think it's best practice to just have everything in an auto scaling group um, because that yeah. way, um, that way, if you want to scale up or down or or whatever, it's really easy. Okay. You decide to scale, or what does the group hold? Does the group uh, hold parameters on how to scale, or does it do things for you, or you just... So, it does, it does a few things. First of all, if an instance dies, it will spin up a new instance. Second of all, uh, you can give it rules on how to scale. You can scale based on, like, metrics data, um, or, like, whatever you want. You can scale based on, like, time of day, like, say, okay, scale, scale up. Uh, in the morning, scale down in the evening. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and you can do it all automatically. Right. So it will launch instances for you or shut down instances according to the provider. Yeah. Thank you. So let's actually look at it. it. Should be up right now. Auto scaling groups. So yeah, we have an auto scaling group here. You can see. One instance running, one instance is hired, three instances max. So if we want to have like three GitLab runners, we can, we can just go to um, edit and just like increase that to three. Got it. And it's a lot easier than like click, click, click to spin up a one server, click, click to spin up another, and so on. So we created this. Uh, So we created this GitLab runner, and so now we're gonna set it up to be a GitLab runner. And so you can try doing this manually. You do GitLab runner register, and then ask for like the runner token um, and stuff like that. You can find the runner token on this page, but that's like a private thing, so I'm not gonna show you the runner token. Okay, I am just still look too closely, but. Uh, 
Okay, so there's an artist book in there. Don't screenshot it, please. Um, and so, there's a front in there too. And so, to register, you do put that token in. To unregister, you just do unregister all runners. And so that this happens automatically on boot and shutdown, we're going to write a systemd service. And I actually didn't include systemd as a technology, but um, I was like, uh, I mistakenly assumed everyone knew Linux, which is silly of me. But systemd is, a, is an init system. Well, it's, a, it's like writing a, how do I describe it? It's, it basically describes how like a, a program like boots and boots so, this is the systemd service we write. So it's a, a one-shot service, and that means that it just runs it once, and it assumes that if it doesn't exit, it's like, okay, like the program's running, so it exited. Um, so it's a one-shot service, remain after exit true, and then to start it, you just do register, non-interactive, and this is all the information. And this Docker volume is this important. We're going to get into that a bit later. So, uh, from my experience, if you have multi user target, it boots too quickly and it can fail to connect to the internet and um, not work. So, you use basic target. One of those random things. What does it do? So, what does what do? Basic target. So, that just defines when in the Linux boot process the program starts. Uh, Multi-user target is kind of in between the boot process. Basic targets later in the boot process. So this is like when we want it to, to happen. So and I have it blanked out there. Uh, although this is live stream, so I guess I'm gonna get hacked now. Um, I don't know if they turned it off. <laughs> anyway, so. There's the runner token there, um, and so to, this should be good about runner token, but basically we, we take, we copy this and we put it into our, um, the variables that I showed you earlier, and then we just put it into the service file of set uh, when we build the AMI. And so we, we did that. And now you can see that when I, that like this, um, that, yeah, you can see this is started up and it actually registered itself with GitLab and it says we have an online runner now. So that's really good. So now that we have. Uh, so when you register the chat with GitLab, you can communicate with GitLab about a new runner? Uh, say that again. You said register with GitLab? Mm -hmm. The runner registers with GitLab. That's what this command is. Uh, user bin GitLab runner register. This is the so register. So the is the same GitLab where you have everything that it's its runner? Yeah, um, so here you can see for URL, I put gitlab.com. Uh, if you, if you self-hosted it, you put a different URL for, for your GitLab. Um, but it ties it together with with GitLab, like the, the software, and then also with the registration token, you tie it into a specific project or a specific group on GitLab. So in this case, I'm tied it um, to the group I made, the Docker Slides group, and to GitLab.com, the um, hosted GitLab that I'm using. And um, we're, we're also gonna talk about this Docker volumes thing here. So, if you Google building Docker images in GitLab, GitLab actually has some nice documentation on that. And they give a bunch of different methods, and I tried all the methods they gave. And the, I'll tell you right now, the correct way to do it is via binding the Docker socket. And what this does, so Docker, the way Docker works is a client server deal. Uh, when you run Docker, that's the Docker client, and it communicates with this Docker daemon via the a socket, a Linux socket, uh, which is var run docker.soc. So if you mount this in Docker, what that means is that 
when you call the Docker client inside a Docker container, because it's mounted, it will actually communicate with the Docker daemon on the host machine. So that's thought very secure, of course, but in order to build uh, Docker images, like, as I said, there isn't enough access like natively, so you need to give it a bit more access. And this is one way to give it more access, by giving the Docker image the ability to communicate with the host Docker. So one of the consequences of this is that when you create, so that, so when, so when you do Docker run or Docker build, it doesn't create a Docker image inside another Docker image. It creates it on the outside, like sort of next to the Docker image that you're inside. I'm not sure how much sense that makes. Yeah, uh, I should probably make a, a diagram. We, we, we got it. Okay. So, and the reason that you want to do that rather than like having Docker inside of Docker is because that way it's a lot easier to cache Docker images that you download, which is very important for build schemes. So this is the GitLab CI YAML for building just one Docker image. Um, you have a script here, you want to create a, that and you want to basically take your docker off, off config and put it into the config.js. A docker off config is, so you, someone was asking about using a private repository um, or private docker images, and one way you do that is by, and the way you do that in GitLab is you have this doc, doc, docker off config variable, which the docker runner uh, uses to authenticate against other repositories when it holds Thing. So we actually take this and then we put it inside, we, we take this, which is normally just used by GitHub, and we actually put it inside the config.json so that, because we're not just running Docker, it's not just that GitLab's running Docker, we're also running Docker inside. So we, we need access to that auth, so that's how we get access to that auth. Then we do a Docker build, and then we do a Docker push. So that's that's the, the gist of it. Now let's, let's actually, look at that in action. So, um, no, this is all the kernel stuff. So if you go to the, the Docker repository, and now you can see my actual commit span here. Um, this is me struggling to get, because I, well, so one of the scripts here, and I'm gonna talk about this in a bit, but one of the scripts I wrote like a script to uh, sort of streamline the build process, and um, I wrote it in Bash. But for this, I didn't want to because because uh, at my company I use a, a private sort of CI container for running stuff in, but I just want to use the the um, uh, Docker. Oh, Docker. I just want to use this um, the official Docker image for this talk because I didn't want to get into like the whole chicken and egg problem of private of building private Docker images and using private Docker images to build other private Docker images. So I'm just using this Docker image in order to build Docker images. Um, but this Docker image, it doesn't have bash, it just has a busybox sh, and so my script didn't work. So I had to adapt it for sh, and so I have just a bunch of build builds somewhere here. Or builds that say it has to be in an image. So, so this, this is me actually uh, building like some Python uh, Docker images in, uh, in GitLab. Maybe you've accomplished their goal. Uh, so now there's a, a few other stupid details. So um, of course there's the Docker off config I talked about. Oh, that's the previous slide. So the first thing is, um, you want to have different environments when you don't want to just have like one environment. You want to have like like a staging and like a production environment and maybe other environments. So to do that, you need to get the the name of the branch from GitLab, um, and then you want to pass it over to uh, you want to pass it over in all sorts of places, basically. So okay, so that's one thing. Then. Uh, ECR um, is the Amazon Container Repo, uh, which we didn't go into, but it's something that 
we use um, and to log into that you basically call AWS ECR region etc etc uh, and you just whatever it spits out you run so that's what that is in bash and then uh, this is an important step that doesn't make any sense but you need to do a docker system prune dash f and I don't know why you need to do that before you run your Docker build, but it doesn't delete anything important, but it does make it so that things cache properly. I had some weird issue with copy with, with copy and my Docker files not caching, and this makes it so that it caches properly. What's the name of this command? Uh, ECR get login. That's to get yeah. your login for so, the Amazon container repository. Yeah, it's, it's, the AWS is like one of the commands, or is it like a see to like... It's a command. It's a, it's the a package CLI. you can install uh, the uh, AWS CLI. CLI. Yeah. Which we didn't go into now. This is sort of like okay. more advanced stuff I'm not going to go into too much detail into. Um, well, you already had this installed, like when you said earlier that we did, we we had run AWS configure, right? Like we had. Been... Oh well, this this actually this actually is not set up. So actually, ignore the AWS thing. If you look at the the script um, that I have here, the .sh script. I actually don't have the the ECR script, but for my company in production, we we have that. We're using, we're pulling everything from, from ECR, uh, just using, we're using like ECR and Docker Hub. But in this case, I, I don't have that because we're not, that's like a sort of extra step. But this is, this is, uh, this is stuff you'd run before all the builds if you were to use ECR, for instance. You'd log into ECR. So per, image that you build, you want to run all these steps. Uh, you, you get the image from a command line argument, and then you do a Docker pull, um, and you pass it into to sed, and you pull out the uh, the digest that you get from the Docker pull. And then uh, you do a Docker build, and you do dot, dot, a dash dash cache from. So you, you basically pull the image you already have and use it as the cache, because you could have multiple uh, you can have multiple GitLab runners, and there's no guarantee that um, that like the cache is up to date. So you use an, an image from the cache, and then that way uh, it's, it's going to be up to date. And then you pass you pass in the environment as a build argument, and um, you tag it with the environment too. And uh, for the Docker file, I would like to end up in uh, Docker. And then you do a Docker push and you get the ending digest from the Docker push using sed. And then actually you can compare the two digests to figure out if the Docker image was changed. Because like if you're building five Docker images in one repository, how do you know like which one was actually changed? And they can also like have one depends on another. Um, so you can't just like look at the files, you need to like see if they actually changed by like doing the build. And, but in this way, you can say like, okay, if they changed, or only if they changed, let's uh, deploy to production, like the new one to production or whatever. Um, and if they didn't change, then we're not going to do any deploys. We're just gonna say like, oh, it's not really anything interesting to do. Um, so yep, that's it, dockerslides.com. For the slides, uh, Docker CI's pop Terraform. I hope I didn't rush through things too fast. Send me tickets and merge requests on GitHub. We're actually not done yet because I did an extra bit today. So we're gonna. I was building Python thingies. So let's let's look at that a bit. So let's see like what a Docker repository actually looks like. So you can see there's a, it's a Python thing, and we have. Python, Django, Wagtail. Yeah. We're gonna look at Wagtail here. Uh, this is a Docker file. You can see we're we're taking from the, the Python image that we built earlier yeah. and doing a bunch of stuff. Here's the, the Python image. Um, we just hit three install virtual M, um, add a Python user, stuff like that. 
And so I will show you what it looks like now. Actually, I have a readme file here. Server, let the server control C, and so on and so on. So now if we go to EC2, we go to our workstation server, which is not in our server. And so if you want to you make a change to this, like, uh, I don't know enough about Django off the top of my head to make a change to this, but does anyone want to, like, uh, change something in the Django or something? I'm not really sure what you change. Um, um, I just, I don't have a setup to easily make changes, because I, I just, yeah. I just ran, like, a Django start project and stuff like that, I didn't actually copy the code in, but in practice you could copy the code in, or you could have the code in a different repository and set it up to download the code, or something like that. So you're telling me that if you're now changing the Django file in GitLab, oh, to, I, I, it will spawn a new... Let me, let me show you. So, um, I have an idea of something I can show. Yeah, the title or something. Yeah, so what I'm actually going to do is, so this is... Django 2.1. So let's use let's downgrade to Django 2.0. Um, I think you do it just like this, right? Uh, that should work. All right. Um, downgrade to Django 2.0. Did you call me? Okay. What did you say? No, I'm sorry. So now it's running. It's deploying a new runner or using the same runner? Or it's, it's using one of the available runners. Um, so it's running in the runner now. It's, so it's building in the runner that you built for, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The runner will always be alive once you put it in. It's like this. The runner is this server right here. It's not yeah. get that runner. So if I shut this down, like this, this will crash. Okay. So the runner is a different process or a different machine that just runs and builds the machines you want and then deploys them and runs them, correct? Uh, well, running them is a, a whole different topic, like, uh, but deploys them, yes. Yeah. So with yeah. The, with the new code, okay, now I understand. So, so yeah. basically you change your line in, G in the GitLab, mm -hmm. so then it will do everything for you. Mm -hmm. You can see it applied different migrations this time. Um, I think the digests are the same. Uh, so the digests are the same for Wagtail. No, so that, no Wagtail. that Docker container is destroyed. What? The Docker container is get destroyed, so that, that means that data wasn't persisted. It was deleted and then well, redeployed, no, right? We, yeah. we, uh, we save the, we, we do a Docker build and then we push it to uh, the Docker Hub. So, oh, yeah. it's I'm always curious if the, image, if the container gets destroyed before it gets deployed again. You're just using the SQLite database, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, it's yeah. so it, it gets destroyed, yeah. yeah. Um, so, where was I? Uh, yeah. So, I've read that you just have to build up like some kind of Postgres SQL inside another yeah. container with Postgres, right? Yeah, to, to set up like an actual thing, you need to have like, like an RDS database. You need gotcha. to have like all. There's a lot more moving parts than actually putting stuff into production. This that's not what this talks about, like how to run Django right, production. Right, right, right. This yeah. is about how to uh, build Docker containers so that um, can be used in GitLab. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And like, if you use Docker in production, then this is obviously really useful because you want to be able to quickly like iterate on that. Um, gotcha. But yeah. you, 
if you want to the, like deploy to production, you need to set up some Docker production thing like your Kubernetes or like whatever you're using, and then uh, have a process for that that you plug this into somehow. So we do a poll, you can see it updated. Uh, then we're gonna do Docker run again. Here, refresh, Django 2.0. Oh, yeah. yep. So, changing oh. versions is that it's easy. The same, it's the same style, but no, no, it's the same IP address eventually. Well, well it's the IP address of my uh, Docker Slides workstation, which is just the computer I'm using to run Terraform. Okay, so, so for the IP to change, you have to stop the uh, instance entirely and then. Uh, uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah. But this this is this isn't like a, a real thing I'm running. I'm, I'm just running this on the equivalent of my laptop. <laughs> it's actually say if you have new code that you want to test mm -hmm. and old code that you want to remain, can you keep it like you know if you have ten servers running and one only one of them will have the new code or something like this? That's really outside the, the scope of this. Um, okay. Like you could. I'm asking if this continuous integration has parameters that allow us to do this. Like 10% of my of my servers will have this and 90% will have that. They're they're tangential. Um, so okay. like that that has to do with how your infrastructure set up basically. Uh, and that's like a I know Google Cloud specifically has like a lot of built-in things for like canary, like canary deployment or whatever, um, or like those kind of updates. Um, for AWS, you need to sort of implement that on your own, like using their API, but that's like really outside of the scope of this. This is just to build the Docker containers, and then if you want to build like like one Docker container tag like new release and one tag old release, and then run the new release on one and the old release on the rest, like that's something you need to set up yourself. This is just to build the thing and get it into Docker Hub. This is, this is just for updating the stuff here, basically. Yeah. Uh, in terms of like this, this is just me playing around on my, my laptop, basically. This is the purpose of all the things I built is to update this stuff. So you can see uh, Django here. Um, uh, there's not really a way to see this because it's not here or anything like that. But. You can, oh, tags, yeah, you can see we pushed four minutes ago, so Docker, so GitLab actually is pushing to Docker Hub. Okay. So, yeah, you can change the version of that, and then, so that's that. Uh, any questions? Yeah, I, I have a couple. Um, what are some best practices around, uh, so here we're building the container, right? Yeah. Do you ever do or see any kind of like verification of the container once it's built? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, so like we could run like, integration tests now that we've got so Quay right? yeah. Quayio is another Docker repository, like Docker Hub, and and they have a lot of uh, built-in. Uh, they have a lot of. They have like some built-in security scanning for your Docker container. So that's, that's one test you can do. In terms of like integration tests, um, like you could, so because I'm mapping the Docker socket, you can sort of nest Docker containers as much as you want, kind of. Um, so you could, so you could, uh, so you could basically have a, like a CI Docker container that has integration test tools that like sort of, um, like runs the container and runs tests against it or, however you decide to set it up. I mean, it really depends on, on your setup or the, like how you do it, but yeah, like once, once you have it built, oh, yeah. you can um, you can run. Like, so you can have like a persistent test container, or is that what you're saying, or? Yeah, I mean, you could you could have a, like a Docker CI job to, to run tests, um, and uh, especially like for, for like Jagger or something to like that's that's like the main purpose of CI. That's like the, the traditional use uh, use case of CI is to have your like your Python code and to automatically run your tests. That's like the, the normal thing CI does. And this is like a a less common use for CI, but like running tests against like your code is like the most 
classic way to use GitLab and other CI platforms um, to run integration tests against like a Docker container itself. Like you could also do that um, through GitLab. That would be like like a huge pop of your thing. So I guess I guess my question is like presumably you're only building this image because well I may be wrong uh, because your your application code tests have already passed right. Or would yeah. you say don't you yeah. build the application code tests until you got well, through this part? Well, that, the way I have it set up, uh, at least at my company, is uh, is is like this, where I have like a repo for the application code, and I have a repo for the Docker images, which I'm using mainly to manage the configuration. And then I have a repo for the MI, actually, and then I have a repo for the Terraform. So that's actually four repos, but three layers, I don't know. Um, and you run CI on all of those? And, and I run CI on three of those, on the, the code, of course, on the, the Docker, and on the, the Packer, okay. not on the Terraform. Um, so, they, they actually run independently. So um, the the code one has this PHP code. It has all these like, PHP unit tests it runs. Um, and the code won't update on the servers unless those tests pass, of course. So the um, so the the Docker images um, the Docker images it it builds the Docker containers and then it deploys them to the servers if they've changed. Uh, there's no testing run on that I ran on that. I'm not sure how to test it. It's probably something I could set up, but I'm, I'm not sure how to do it yet. Um, but the way I make sure that I don't accidentally break everything is I have a staging environment and I, I run stuff on that and then I version it to master. It, it should be, I'd say it should be pretty much the same. Um, so, and then like the the AMI stuff, I have automatically, the packer images I have automatically building. Um, I don't actually have implemented them automatically deploying yet, but I'm going to implement that like next week, probably. Um, and yeah, Terraform, I do all by hand because it's very finicky and it needs like a lot of. Question. Can you run GitLab without Terraform or Packer? Yes, of course. You only um, have to use the Git, the uh, YML, the Git, uh, I forget the name of the file, the docs. GitLab, uh, YAML, YAML file, and then be very specific as to what commands you enter there, and uh, no. it will still run the process? Well, so, I'm not using Terraform to run GitLab. GitLab's running on GitLab.com. Gotcha. I'm, I'm using Terraform to automatically set up uh, GitLab runners. Oh, gotcha, and, gotcha, okay. And yes, you can set up a GitLab runner by spinning up an EC2 instance, Installing the necessary software, gotcha. configuring it or whatever, and then you can shut it down, and then you can right click and say create AMI from instance, and then or you, or you don't even need to make an AMI. You could just spin up EC2 instance, install the stuff, and just have it sit there and hope it doesn't crash. Um, and then uh, you could and that could be plugged into GitLab, and then you'd be you wouldn't have to do any of this. Um, gotcha. No, yeah. But then totally, it's just yeah. you did it all by hand, and why are you doing that? Gotcha. Yeah, no. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much. Right, we'll go again. Hey, I, I don't think we have anything else. Good. All right. There's always time for lightning talks, so if anybody feels like doing a lightning talk, feel free. But uh, otherwise, I think we're ready to go. Yep. And so I know that wasn't like you traditionally get, but there wasn't much notice. You saw one. I had this talk prepared. Um, I thought I said that thing that's pretty cool. Thank you. That was a yeah. lot of work there. It was, it's, 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 it's very it's very great talk. Yeah, yeah but it's, it, there's a learning curve on it. it like obviously to, to figure out how to do all this didn't take me the span of two hours. So, so. well, like the first slide is your first evening. If you're like just yeah. tackling this stuff, the first slide where you yeah. go and set up an instance and you know, <laughs> yeah. the IAM credentials and stuff. Oh, that's, well, that's not, and yeah, this, 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 but what's, 
what I think holds a lot of people back is there's people, there's so many people who are afraid to register AWS accounts because they're like, oh man, I'm just giving them my credit card information and hoping they don't bankrupt me. And that's 100% true, but you should do it anyway. I don't know, they, 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 they won't be that Give them a... But they will take 60 cents a month for something like well, this. Well, yeah, it's, they, if you're like a normal human being, they don't actually charge you that much. You're, you're fine. Uh, if you have a job, uh, you're, you're going to be able to afford it. So just, just make an AWS account, just give them your credit card. Um, if you're a company, uh, they, they, they cost money. Uh, they do make a lot of money on AWS, but you should, you should take the lunch. You should just make an AWS account. Uh, don't worry about like the free tier stuff. Like, yeah, you get some stuff for free, but don't like. Am I going to be charged five cents? That's a disaster. Like, just. You just could do it. all this stuff on T2 micros or whatever, right? Uh, yeah, but why? Take longer. You have a job. Come on. <laughs> uh, presumably, if, if you're a college student, uh, I don't know. Well, I could give you some like, money. Like, I could give some money. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. So. Yeah, and uh, if anyone would like a fidget spinner? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that'll be fun. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. <laughs> 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 